Sir Isaac Newton once said, If I have seen further, it is because I stand on the shoulder of giants. He gave credit to the people who came before him, whose work he built upon. And because of that, he had many great discoveries. Three laws of motion we credit to him. We talked about his first law of motion in a previous video. I'll recap it briefly here, but to get the full picture, you will need to go back and rewatch that video or watch the previous video. Here, I'm going to focus my attention on the second and third law by Isaac Newton in terms of his laws of motion. First of all, a recap real quickly of the first law of motion, which basically says if an object is at rest, it's going to stay at rest unless you put a force on it that makes it move. If an object is moving, it's going to move in a constant velocity in a straight line forever, unless there's a net force on it that causes it to accelerate. That is his first law. Basically, what it, if an object is... A, Can I have your attention, please, Robin? It basically says that if an object is moving, or if an object is re at rest, it's going to keep doing that unless there's an unbalanced force on it. Okay, that is the first law. The second law is a mathematical one. This says this. The sum of the forces acting on an object is equal to mass times acceleration. Here, this is the Greek letter sigma, which means the sum of. That implies there could be more than one, and you'd have to add up every single one that was acting on the object. So if you have six forces acting on an object, you have to add up all six. Now, we don't typically deal with six in this class, and we are only going to add up in one direction, either the x-axis or the y-axis at a time. So typically, it is one, two, and occasionally three that you would have to add up. But the sum of all forces is equal to the mass times the acceleration. This is Newton's second law. The sum of all forces equals mass times acceleration. You can apply this to an object or to a system. So you can have a system of multiple objects. You can look at the acceleration of the entire system, but of course you have to have the mass of the entire system, and that would uh, um, allow you to figure out the force on the whole system, or you can do that just for a single object, okay? One of the things you can see here is that if you have a larger mass, so if you have the same amount of force, we keep force the same, but we have a small mass here, you get a certain acceleration. Now, if we go to a larger mass, with the same force, a larger mass will lead to a smaller acceleration. What we see is if your car engine has the same amount of horsepower and providing the same force to your tires, the more junk you put in your trunk, the smaller your acceleration is going to be. If you have a truck like me and you have a trailer behind it, like I sometimes do, and you fill it full of hay because your wife won't get rid of the horses, like I sometimes do, you know that when your trailer is full of hay, you have to punch down on that accelerator to get a bigger force, get any kind of acceleration. Because when you're pulling 5,000 pounds of hay, you have a much bigger mass in your vehicle you're trying to accelerate. And so either, you're going to use the same force and have a tiny acceleration or you're going to have to have a much bigger force to give you the same acceleration. Okay? Uh, you might notice that when you're stopping as well. One time I was pulling a load of hay. I'm driving down the red mine to my own. This lady pulls out right in front of me. I'm pulling a load of hay. I slam on the brakes. Do you think I can stop on a dime? No! Because I had a velocity and a large mass. And with a big mass, I have a small acceleration. That includes the negative acceleration to slow down. I could barely slow down. I thought I was going to run this lady over. Fortunately, I didn't, but it was close. Let's take a look at this. We're going to go ahead and demonstrate several of Newton's laws, or at least the first two, and with several examples uh, with this cart on this track. And the first law. First part is very easy to demonstrate. The car is at rest. There are actually forces on it, but those forces are balanced, so the net force adds up to zero. And when there's no net force, there's no acceleration. And if you look at the car, it's not accelerating. 
The second part of Newton's first law we can also demonstrate with this car on the track. If I give the car a push and then let go of it, we're going to watch its motion as it goes across. Um, I want you to see this is going to go with constant velocity when I'm not pushing it. So I'm going to go ahead and we'll measure this velocity versus time um, on this graph here because I have a motion sensor set up to record it. So I'm going to go ahead and start that and then we get it moving. Okay, we'll go ahead and stop. So there's several things to realize here. Um, first of all, what happened here with this red line? Well, that's when my hand was going in front of the sensor, pushing it. But once the cart started moving on across the track and I got my hand out of the way, notice what happened. It moved at constant velocity. Because when no one was pushing on it, when it was just moving and in that force equals zero, the acceleration had to be zero and to move with constant velocity. Please don't think just because it's moving it has a net force on it. This thing, when I pushed on it to accelerate it, there was a force on it. But after that, while it was moving across there, the net force on it was zero. Therefore, move with constant velocity. Anytime you move with constant velocity, the net force is zero. You may think to yourself, if things move so well, with no forces acting on it, how come when I push something across the table, it comes to a stop? That's because there is a force acting on it. There's a force of friction acting on that. That's what brought it to a stop. Don't be silly. Here we have the car. It's back on the track. I'm going to use this fan. It's a fan that blows air like air to come back. Okay? It's going to blow air out and it's going to push the car across, but it's going to provide a constant force. So the force will be on the cart the whole time. Now, if the force is on the cart the whole time it's going, then there's going to be an acceleration the whole time. That's Newton's second law, F equals MA. We put a force on there, it has a mass, it's going to accelerate. Let's check it out. So, and we'll collect. Awesome. So, you can see this is accelerating because the line is on horizontal. You see the velocity is increasing by the, by the slope of that line. What I'm going to do is increase the mass of the vehicle. Now I'm going to apply the same force with the fan and we're going to see what changes. If you have the uh, same force but you have more mass, what will that do to your acceleration? Well, remember, acceleration is the slope here. I'm going to go ahead and save that last run. Uh, okay. Okay. Now you can see there that the slope of that one is much slower. It actually took more time, so much so it went off the screen. I'm going to zoom in to, uh, so you get a better look at it. You can see that the acceleration with more mass is much less. With three times the mass here on the blue line, we get about one third the acceleration of what the red line was. You can tell it's about one third the slope. In fact, you can get numbers if I go ahead and ask, uh, bring up the tool here. So the slope for the first one is 0.13, and the slope for the slower run with more mass is 0.0. Four, seven. Almost one third because we almost tripled the mass. We had the same force with more mass, gave us much less acceleration. That's Newton's second law. We will often use Newton's second law to solve problems in physics. What you would do is add up all the forces. Well, you start by doing a free body diagram so you can identify your forces. Then you would add up all the forces in a particular direction and set them equal to MA. So, you could say the sum of all forces in the x direction equal mass times acceleration, and that would be an x direction acceleration. And separately, you could say the sum of all forces in the y direction equals mass times acceleration in the y direction. And we can pull these forces right off our free body diagram and calculate those accelerations. This is a very common thing we do in physics. Newton's third law is a little bit different in that the first law applies to one object, one free body diagram. Where with Newton's third law, you're comparing two different objects, two different free body diagrams. And it says,
the force on one object is equal and opposite to the force on the other object, assuming this, those two objects are what cause forces on each other. So if we talk about you punching a wall, you could talk about the force your hand put on the wall, but the wall also put a force back on your hand. And they have to be equal and opposite. Equal in magnitude, same amount of force, opposite in direction, one pushing toward the wall, one pushing away from it. And so you can't hit a wall any harder than the wall hits you back. It's the same amount of force, just in the opposite direction. Now this is a little bit misconfused sometimes. People, you know, they get a hammer and a nail. Knock, 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 hammer on the nail. Where is there more force, on the hammer or the nail? It's the same force. Because of Newton's third law, the hammer can't hit the nail with any more force than the nail hits the hammer. Why then does a nail go into the wood and not the hammer? Well, here's why. Because you re relate this to Newton's second law, mass times acceleration, you see that the mass times acceleration of the hammer has to equal the mass times acceleration of the nail. But that's not really proportional because the hammer got a much bigger mass and the nail's got a much smaller mass. So to make those proportions equal, you have to get a much bigger acceleration out of the nail. So the nail is going to have a greater acceleration, even though the force is the same. By the way, that's my mama's favorite equation. Ha! Mama's favorite equation. Here, I have two spring scales. I have a spring scale here and a spring scale here. I'm going to connect them together. So now they are connected. Now I'm going to hold my hand to, I guess it would be your left the one, this hand, it's going to be stationary, and I'm going to do all the pulling with the other hand. But notice what happens, just I'm holding it stationary, I'm pulling with the other one, notice they're both reading about the same, I guess in this case 11, around 11 or 12 Newtons, because the force is the same on both. If I try to hold this hand still and pull with the other one, they still read the same. Now I know they're not exactly the same. That's not because the forces are different. That's because the equipment's cheap and not very accurate. But the forces, you can't pull harder one direction you're pulling on the other. But you have to have two different objects. Newton's third law pairs never show up in the same free body diagram. If you're talking about one force acting on another object and, and causing it to move, and what's the force back on that? Well, you have two different objects, okay? With Newton's third law, one object is putting a force on another object. Um, if not, you don't have an acceleration. Here, we have a similar thing. We have two carts, and there's a rubber band connecting them, such as putting a force on both carts, okay? Now, the force being exerted by the rubber band is going to be the same on both carts, and you can tell that because they have the same mass, they're for the same acceleration, therefore the center of mass isn't going to move. So I pull them back and release them, and they meet at the center. Well, what if one car had three times the mass of the other? Well, that would offset the center of mass. So the center of mass of this would be over here. And notice that's where they're going to meet up when I release these. The force is the same. The one on the left is going to have uh, a smaller acceleration. This one on here on the right will have a bigger acceleration, my right anyway. And so they'll meet up somewhere around there, okay? And there you see it. The center of mass did not move, but the cart with less mass had a bigger acceleration because with less mass you get a bigger acceleration. With the bigger mass you have a smaller acceleration. One of the neat things about Newton's third law is realizing that every force has an opposite force from whatever caused it. And one of the things you can think about, okay, What's pulling me down right now is the force of gravity. The Earth pulls me down with this force of gravity. What will be the opposite force from that? Well, the opposite force can't ever be in the same free body diagram. You're probably thinking it's the force normal, but it's not. The opposite force is me putting the force back on the same object that caused it. What caused me to have the force of gravity? The Earth. Therefore, I'm putting a force down on the Earth. Now, my feet are just touching the floor of the Earth. And, and so nothing moves, but when I jump, the force of gravity pulls me back down. Does that mean the same force of gravity is pulling the earth back upward? Yes. Why don't we notice that happening? Let's look at the map. The force has to be the same on me and on the earth. Now, for me, the force is equal to 
mg, and that's the same force as on the Earth. Now, I'm going to put the Earth's mass here, and we'll look at the Earth's acceleration. Those forces have got to be the same. I have a mass of about two, uh, 100 kilograms, about 200 pounds. About 100 kilograms. G is equal to 9.8 meters per second squared. The mass of the Earth is about 6 times 10 to the 24th kilograms times A. So this is the equation set up where this would be the acceleration of the Earth caused by me jumping. Okay? So let's do it. 100 times 9.8 divided by 6 times 10 to the 24th kilograms. That gives the Earth an acceleration of 1.6 times 10 to the negative 22 meters per second squared. You're never going to notice that. That's way too small. You may be thinking to yourself, well, what if everybody on Earth jumped? Even still too small. If you multiply that mass by everybody on Earth, and I think it's something like 3 billion people, that's 3 times 10 to the 9th. Okay, let's do that calculation with everybody jumping in the same spot on Earth. 3e to the 9th times 100 times 9.8 divided by 6.0 times 10 to the 24th. And you get, with everybody on Earth jumping at the same time, 4.9 times 10 to the negative 13th meters per second squared. You see the Earth is just so big, so big and massive, it's going to have a small acceleration. That doesn't mean the force isn't on it. Whenever I jump, I put a force on the Earth. It just has a small acceleration because of the large mass. I was once in a bathroom stall. And I don't recommend it, but I read the graffiti on the wall. And it said, Chuck Norris doesn't do push-ups. He pushes the Earth down. And I thought to some degree, that's true. But it's true for me and you as well. Think about that. Okay, so let's review the big ideas we learned today. Um, first, how much net force is needed on a 500 kilogram space probe in order for it to move with constant velocity between Earth and Mars? Go ahead, think about your answer. The answer is zero. Zero force is needed. Why? Why don't you need any force to, to travel? Well, here's the clue. Constant velocity. If you are moving with constant velocity, it implies that your acceleration is zero. This is Newton's first law. If you're not accelerating, then your net force must equal zero. Okay, either moving at constant velocity or stationary, as long as you are not accelerating, your net force is equal to zero. Newton's first law. Let's go ahead and try this out. How much net force is needed on a 500 kilogram space probe in order for it to move with constant acceleration of two meters per second per second? Okay, go ahead and figure this one out. Okay, there is a net force here. This is a Newton's second law problem. Uh, and you can, it's a very simple one. You can simply say the sum of the forces equals mass times acceleration. The mass is 500, the acceleration is two. 500 times two says the net force must be a thousand Newtons. So you'd have to have a thousand Newtons of net force on that probe in order to give it an acceleration of two meters per second squared. All right, let's try another one. So now, a 500 kilogram space probe is going 1,400 meters per second through space, and it hits a, uh, I, I doubled up my A's, it hits a, a much smaller 10 kilogram asteroid and knocks it out of the way. Which object, the space probe or the asteroid, has more force on from the collision. So here you can see our space probe, there's the asteroid, the space probe is moving very quickly, hits the asteroid, knocks it out of the way. Which object has more force on it? The force is the same on both. Why is the force the same on both? Because of Newton's third law. 
this very force is equal and opposite. So the asteroid can't hit the space probe any harder than the space probe hits it at. Hits it back. There's one collision. The force is going to be the same on both. Let's have a follow-up question. And I'll get my head out of the way. Does the asteroid or space probe have a larger ex acceleration? So does the asteroid or the space probe, I don't know why probe is capitalized, or asteroid, quite frankly, um, have a larger acceleration? Well, the acceleration is going to be greater on the object with less mass, assuming the force is going to be the same, and we know that they are. So the asteroid will have a greater acceleration because both objects have the same force on them, and the asteroid has less mass. By the way, we're going to be doing some uh, problems with the second law as well, but that's going to be in another video. I'm Mr. Collins.